Good morning, St. Luke. It's so good to be with you this morning. It's, I'm so glad to be back uh, from vacation. Uh, uh, I feel like I was telling uh, Jackie and Deacon Paul that uh, I feel like I haven't been here in, in a year. Uh, so I'm so glad to be back with you to, to worship. Uh, we begin uh, our service with the order of confession and absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for us and for his sake, forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with our opening hymn, um, The Church, One Foundation. <laughs> Let us pray. 
O oh God, with all your faithful followers of every age, we praise you, the rock of our life. Be our strong foundation and form us into the body of your Son, that we may gladly minister to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading comes from Isaiah 51, beginning with the first verse. Listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hung, to the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation. For a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near. My salvation has gone out. My arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, and look at the earth beneath. For the heavens vanish like smoke. The earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner. But my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. The epistle comes from Romans, chapter 11, beginning with verse 33. O oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are his judgments, and how inscrutable his ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one of another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, and the one who leads with zeal, and the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. This is the word of the God, Lord. Thanks be God. We continue with our gospel acclamation, and we speak that together. Alleluia, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound. And whatever you bind on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in, loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. We continue with our hymn of the day, Built on a Rock.
Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God, our Father, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was, who is, and who is to come. And again, we continue this week with our, uh, our sermon series from uh, uh, Dr. David Schmidt from Concordia Seminary in St. Louis, God's A Greater Story. And we continue in our study on the our sermon series on the Book of Romans. So the poet Elizabeth Barry, Barrett Browning once wrote, Earth's cramped with heaven and every common brush a fire with God, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. Earth is cramped with heaven. God comes down from heaven and touches the earth, filling it with his glory, but only those who see take off their shoes. Our readings this morning invite us to be among those who see. They invite us to see the earth crammed with heaven, to see God in Christ who has, who has come down from heaven and touched the earth to fill it with his glory. Consider the Old Testament reading this morning. Here we have a vision from Isaiah. Isaiah writes to a future people, suffering in exile away from Jerusalem, and he reveals for them a world crammed full of heaven. Look, he cries, and there he reveals the wonder of God. One family, Abraham and Sarah, touched by God's grace and the source of God's blessing for all the nations of the world. One sees the glory of God spread as, as God multiplies the descendants of Abraham. We've kind of been talking about that the last couple of weeks, extending his blessings from one family to all nations. Isaiah promises that the wasteland of Jerusalem, the city that's devastated, will experience a rebirth and blossom like the Garden of Eden. Songs of sharp sorrow will become shouts of joy. God's salvation will go forth, and through heaven, and though heaven and earth pass away, God's righteousness will remain. His salvation will endure forever. In the Holy Gospel this morning, we find uh, we find uh, we find Caesarea Philippi crammed full of heaven. Jesus has drawn his disciples far north, far above the Sea of Galilee, where the land breaks forth into hills and, and waterfalls and fresh-flowing mountain springs. This place was ancient. It had been a site for worshiping Baal among the Canaanites, and then Pan among the Greeks, and then Caesar among the Romans. And as cultures changed, so did the worship. Now here, Peter confesses heaven-touching earth in the unchanging worth of God, now seen in Jesus Christ. This is not an ancient pagan religion. Peter doesn't worship a fertility god like Baal or a god of nature like Pan or a god of political state like Caesar. No, Peter worships God, the creator of all things, who promised to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. And now it has come to live and walk among his people. Peter confesses Jesus, a Jew, a Nazarene, to be the Christ, the Son of the living God. What Isaiah prophesies in the Old Testament reading and what Peter confesses in the Gospel reading is what the Apostle Paul celebrates as he writes to the Christians in Rome. Paul has seen the earth crammed with heaven and in these few verses, he shares with us a life-transforming vision. This morning, we'll, we'll take some time first to consider Paul's vision and then to see how it transforms our lives for service in God's world. So consider Paul's vision. You know how sometimes you, you look at the sun and then you look away and your vision is touched by an afterimage of light? You see the people around you, but they, they look different. They bathe in the glow of light. And this is what happens with the Apostle Paul in our text. He sees a brilliant vision, the glorious work of God extending to all nations. And then, when Paul turns and looks to the people of Rome, he sees them in a totally different way. Consider the wonder of Paul at the beginning of our text. Paul is in awe of God's story of salvation, fulfilled in the world. Paul writes, Oh, the depths and the riches and the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and inscrutable his ways. 
You see, Paul's seen a vision of the end of the story. The restoration of all people, peoples in the church, the new Israel of God. That vision is the fulfillment, fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy from our Old Testament reading this morning. Isaiah prophesied at the, uh, of a time with, of joy and gladness, of thanksgiving and song. Isaiah promises that when the ransom of the Lord will return and come to Zion, everlasting joy shall be upon their heads, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. This is what happens for the Apostle Paul. He sees the day of restoration when God brings about a gathering of nations, all nations, Jews and Gentiles, into the church. And Paul's sorrow turns to singing, his sighing into praise. It's as if Paul has seen the light of a beautiful sunset, a glorious ending to a long and difficult day. I just experienced that last week on vacation. We, we, we had a cottage at, uh, on, on a lake up in uh, Canandaigua, New York, and it was beautiful. And it was like breathtaking. And you know what? After a long day, tiring day, running around, doing you know, fit, you know, vacation type stuff, you know, we were tired. But when we came back and looked at that sunset, we were joyful. So his song, Paul's song, changes from sorrow to joy, from sighing to gladness. He offers praise and thanksgiving and, and glory to God. But then Paul turns his eyes to the church in Rome. Now, the Roman Christians would have not have been glorious to the world around them. Not many of them were rich. Not many of them were powerful. And they gathered together in small house churches, Kind of like what we're doing right now during COVID, right? We're, we're worshiping from our church, from our homes. Our homes are becoming small house churches. Their lives, their, those Roman lives, lives are a far cry from the glories of Rome, much less the glories of heaven. And yet Paul, as Paul looks at these people, he sees earth crammed with heaven, and he writes so that they join him in celebrating the wonder of God. Paul writes this morning, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. You here notice how Paul uses the language of sacrifice. The sacrificial worship of God's people, that's what we do. That glory of the temple of Jerusalem is transformed. God's people become sacrifices outside the temple, outside Jerusalem hidden inside the small churches, gathering in the heart of the large empire in Rome. These people are God's people, transformed into sacrifices, living, holy, and acceptable to God. Paul knew that the sacrifice of Jesus Christ put an end to simple sacrifices. His death was the perfect sacrifice. He was the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and by his sacrifice, God's people were freed from offering sacrifices for sins. And by his sacrifice, they were free to become sacrifices, living sacrifices of praise, as they poured out their lives in service in the world. So as Paul looks at the people of Rome, he sees an after image of God's glory. They are the body of Christ at work in the world. Paul begins to see the gifts of the Spirit poured out upon the people prophecy, service, teaching, exhortation, contribution, leadership, and mercy. And not only does God freely forgive all sins, but he also freely bestows more gifts so that people have a purpose and a place in God's greater story. God has a greater plan for each person in his salvation story. And this is the vision that Paul sees. It stirs his heart with wonder. It opens his mouth with praise. Earth is crammed with heaven as God gathers his people and transforms them for spiritual service in the world. Earth is crammed with heaven, Elizabeth Barrett Browning once said. But only he who sees takes his shoes off. And, and that's the trouble with God's people. Often they don't see the vision of God at work in in their lives and world. So for the Apostle Paul, there was some concern 
that the Roman Christians would take pride in their status and gifts for service. So Paul gives them this warning, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone not to think of himself more highly than he ought. God's people today, however, have often the opposite problem. Ask a fellow Christian how God works among his people and see what they say. Often we will point to the service of others rather than confess God's work through our lives. Often we'll point to moments set apart for worship rather than confess God's work in daily life. For example, some will point to the pastor of a congregation. Maybe me. Maybe Pastor Friendly. Maybe Pastor Minix. Or any other pastors that you know. He's God's servant. The one the Holy Spirit has called through God's people to serve in their midst. And they're right. But God's work is not limited to me. God's work is not limited to limited to like Pastor Fraley or Pastor Minix. Give it some more thought and you may name a few other members. Old members. Everybody remembers Bill, right? Uh, Bill. Um, having a CD moment. Bill. Me, Bill Mead. Duh. Right? Bill Mead. The reason why I'm here. Because he greeted me after my first time I worshipped here. How about the faithful members? How about those who have gone before us, the saints before us? And soon our mind drifts from the present to the past, and then we begin to speak of how God worked among his people. Great figures of faith come to mind. We talk about what God did through his servant, Martin Luther, the music of Bach, the inspiring hymn of Gerhardt, many of our hymns, you know, if you don't look at the bottom of the page, we don't know who, our, who the author of our hymns are, right? We see and celebrate God's gift to the church, how God calls, how he gathers, how he enlightens, how he equips members for the service in a particular time and place. But, but turn from the past to the present and the vision change. The glory fades until we see a very small group or very few people when we speak of serving of God. Our vision is nowhere near the inclusiveness of all embracing celebration of all. Listen today to the Apostle Paul. He invites you today to trust in God's promises and experience his greater plan for you. You know, I'm going to go off the, this, this sermon series for a second, but, you know, we've talked, we've tr always tried to talk about how we can be in mission here at St. Luke, right? And sometimes when we do things, it's, we kind of see the same people involved in that type of work. And I don't think necessarily that people... Um, I feel people don't feel they're equipped to do what they what they need to do in mission, right? They feel inadequate, um, and that's maybe the, one of the reasons why people new people don't come to work with mission and ministry here at St. Luke. So I call you today that you're baptized, and you can do it, no matter what you do to spread the gospel. God has, has brought about your salvation in Jesus Christ. He's offered the perfect sacrifice that takes away the sins of the world, that forgives your blindness and opens your eyes to see and your lives to celebrate the working of God. And God does more than work in the lives of others. He works in your life for others in this world. This is why Paul starts, starts to name gifts such as teaching, service, leadership, mercy. And the list isn't complete. It's only suggested. But Paul names these things so that you can see how God is at work in your life. He invites you today to be transformed by the renewal of your mind. He encourages you to test and discern God's good and gracious will life. You may devote your life to caring for people. Maybe you're a nurse. Maybe you're a doctor. Maybe you're a teacher. 
or building or fixing homes. And that stewardship, that's a stewardship of creation and it's a gift from God. And not all people are called to such service. Not all people are called to be a pastor. Not all people are called to be an organist like Janet. Not all people are called to be a psychologist like Deacon Paul. Not all people are called to be the director of family life and ministry like Jackie. But God in Christ has called you and equipped you for this work. So you may teach the faith to your children, not in formal classes with desks and lectures and quizzes about it, but, but, but informally. In the car as you drive your son or your daughter to soccer practice and talk about the challenges in his faith. Or at, a, or at a nursing home as your children visit their grandfather and you offer to pray. You see, parenting is a gift from God. And not all people are called to such service. But God in Christ has called you and equipped you for this work. Martin Luther taught us to see the marvelous expanse of the mercies of God through the work, through us in our vocations. You know, Luther said, you know, when you hear vocations, if you're somebody like me, who grew up, uh, uh, who grew up uh, Roman, you know, in a Roman Catholic church, vocations was a priest, a nun, or a religious brother. That was a vocation. But Luther, if you read the small catechism, the greatest vocation is husband, wife, father, child, supervisor, manager, boss. Those are your vocations. To live in God's mercy is to enter the world and discover God at work in our humble lives. He transforms us for our service. There's a, a little book by Brother Lawrence. He's a very, uh, uh, I, forget, I think he was a 12, in the 12th century maybe, and he talked about how his work as, he was not a priest, and he basically took care of the residence where the brothers and the priests lived. And, you know, he was the, he was the pots and pans cleaner. He was the one sweeping the floors. And he found God and how that gift of what he was doing was God, his way of sacrifice and thanksgiving to God. And if you ever get a hold of that book, it's, it's really great. I've, I've read it once or twice in the past. But it's very, in his humble work, he's, he, in his humble work, God calls him. There's a monument east of London at Three Greens Mills. Three, three Mills Green. It has it pictures two hands together, joined together in self-sacrificial service. I believe it's probably on the cover of your service folder uh, that Laura sent out attached to this. Over 100 years ago, Thomas Pickett was working in a, in a well and he was overcome by carbonic acid, the quote, foul air that gathered in the well and Jeffrey Nicholson responded and he went and reached out his hand to help, and he was followed by Frederick Elliott, and then Robert Underhill, each worker in succession, offering a saving hand to rescue, rescue. And each worker died in the end. To remember these men in their self-sacrificial service, a worker's memorial was erected. Two hands joined together in sacrificial service. So if you're ready to go to London, it would be easy to miss this monument. After all, London's filled with so many glorious things to see the crown jewels, the big, big Ben, Buckingham Palace, the changing of the guard. But there in East London, at Three Mills Green, stands a much humbler sight. A memory, a, member, a memory of people, of ordinary people, who offered their lives in acts of self-sacrificial love. In their daily vocation, and their daily vocation became a place for service, service to others and service to God. This place does not gather many crowds and it does not inspire tourists, but it does recall the way God works in the world. And through the lives of his people and their daily vocations. So this is how God's hand reaches out into our world. He touches his people, transforming them for services that they offer their gifts as a sacrifice of praise. And what this monument does in East London, Paul does with his words in this letter. He calls us to see the glory of God. 
hidden in the lives of people in the self-sacrificial service on earth. Our world would have us conform to its ways. Seek glory and power by gaining things for ourselves. He with the most toy wins. In the ways of our world, religion can be one more tool we use to make ourselves better. It's a self-help thing. Claiming the power of God to gain glory on earth. But God's ways are different, however. Humble, hidden, sacrificial, selfless. In a world attracted by glory, the Apostle Paul asks you to seek God's greater plan for you. You have been joined to the body of Christ, made, made part of his people by the forgiveness of your sins. And now Paul invites you, in view of God's mercy, to no longer be conformed to this world, but to be transformed for service, to live by giving rather than gaining, by service rather than selfishness. And in this way, the church is the after image of the glory of Christ. It reveals the ways of God in the world. We are the body of Christ, drawn into his public ministry. Our lives are monuments of this self-sacrificial love, hand over hand as in that monument. Each life touched by the hand of God. Your life joined to the ministry of Christ. Your hand in Christ's hand. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. Amen. And now may the peace which passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We please stand uh, for we, we continue our service. You can stand if you're sitting at home as Deacon Paul leads us in our confession of faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. With Christians around the world, we are bold to confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident in your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, our rock, you are our foundation in Jesus Christ, your Son, whom we confess as the living God. Prepare your church for its mission in bearing witness to Christ, both here at home and throughout the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call forth praises from the far reaches of the universe to the smallest of creatures. Join our songs to theirs, that a spirit of praise and thanksgiving will arouse us to cherish this wondrous home you give us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord. Direct the leaders of countries, legislators and magistrates, mayors and councils to walk in your ways. Help leaders regard those in need with mercy and fulfill your loving purposes in governance of peoples. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You call us into this community in which we, though many, are one in Christ. May we recognize in ourselves and in one another the unique gifts you have given us for the building up of the church for the sake of the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Though we walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve us, deliver us, and fulfill us, our purpose. According to your steadfast love, grant healing and wholeness to those who are bereaved, in trouble, adversity, or sick, or in care of need. Especially John Aleppa, Richard Carlstrand, Deacon Eileen, Franz, Hannah Frayla, Belle Pale, Trish Claire, Beth Kras, Axel Bench, Lisa Norberg, Vincent Papa, Craig Phillips, Geraldine Rizzo, 
Walter Schaefer, and Kathy Gaby, and those on our friends and family list, and those we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You are the everlasting rock from which we were home, and you restore your people to joy and gladness. In blessed memory and hope, we thank you for the lives of the beloved dead. Bring us with them to your heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. My apologies to Deacon Paul. I left the music stand. Mea culpa, mea culpa, mea culpa. Sorry, Paul. I was off that stuff. Um, so this is our time for stewardship in our service. Once again, I haven't, like I haven't been here the last couple of weeks, uh, but thank you so much for your gifts and tithes. Um, and, you know, the, today's sermon was really kind of uh, your, about your sacrifice, right? Like your sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to God. So how can you use your time, talent, and treasures, right? It's, it's not about me. It's about going out to the community, whether that community includes your family. That includes include your neighbors. So, um, you know, uh, thank you again. And, you know, how can you use your time, talent, and treasures this week? Uh, we conclude our service as we pray the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. One last announcement today. We'd ask you to pray for the family of little Michael Oliver Finnegan, who will be baptized immediately after the service. Uh, he's a... Uh, he was supposed to be baptized in April, I think it was the first Saturday in April, and with COVID, you know, all the baptisms like little Luke and Jackie and, uh, have been put off. But you know what? We have a good problem here in St. Luke. We have a baptism schedule every single Saturday or Sunday from now until, I believe, uh, September 13th. So we have, I think, five or six baptisms scheduled, and I have to call another family up this week. Um, to schedule another baptism. So that's a great, not a problem, but that's a great thing, isn't it? So, um, and hopefully soon we'll be able to bring those baptisms back during the worship service. So, um, receive the benediction. Receive the blessing of Almighty God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. We, we, we close with our closing hymn. Come thou fount of every blessing.
us begin. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 